I'm Maureen Cole, the town historian, and today we're going to visit with two gentlemen who have lived in town almost 200 years, if we count their ages together. <laughs> I'll be talking with Dr. Peter Trez of Twin Lakes and Dr. Eugene Tadaldi, also of Twin Lakes. So those are both familiar names, I think, in this town. Peter has lived here all his life. In fact, it may even go back before his life began, if, if uh, I remember what he told me. And Gene has lived here most of his life. So uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk with these two gentlemen. And as I say, together, I think uh, uh, Gene will be celebrating his 96th birthday. Seventh. 97th birthday. Okay. And, December or later on this year? February, it's coming oh, February. Oh, February, all oh, right. And Peter just celebrated his 90th birthday. Correct. So, uh, what we're hoping to do today is to talk over memories of living in town, especially in the Three Lakes area. Jean first came to uh, the area of the Three Lakes and lived on Lake Wakaba, correct? With That's your correct. And Peter, his history goes back to life on Lake Oscalita. Now, if anybody doesn't really know what the Three Lakes area is, it's the northern part of town, just under Wakabuck Mountain, and it includes the three, three, uh, their spring-fed lakes. They are uh, natural lakes, probably created back in the time of the glaciers, if not before. 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, right, glacier time. Right. Wakabuck, Lake Wakabuck is the furthest west, and that is the largest and the deepest lake. And then we have the Twin Lakes. We have Oscalita, which is about half the size of Wakabuck, and middle as far as depth. And then we have, and Peter lives on Oscalita. Jean lives on Ripawam, which is the smallest lake and the most shallow. Although I think you told me the deepest part of the shallowest lake is near your house. Is that correct? The deepest part of... Of Ripawam. Of Ripawam is right outside my dock, and I've measured it 22 feet. That's oh, okay. the deepest I got. And the fishing is good. Excellent. Okay. So, we're going to be talking about things like that. We're also going to be talking about the stewardship of the area and how over the past 60, 70 years, how things have changed in the lakes and how uh, the people who live there now are looking to be stewards for the future of the lake. So we'll get talking about that, I hope, <coughs> as well as sharing memories of growing up on the lake. Um, a little background of the lake, I'm, of the lake area, I mentioned the lakes are all natural. Uh, they are surrounded on one side by mountain, mountainous terrain. Uh, mountainous for our part of the country, 900 feet, I think, is probably uh, an average for, for the mountains there. Uh, they have been used by humans for over probably 9,000 years. It certainly was home to the indigenous people of the area and around Lake Wakabuck. Signs of this use have been found. So I'm not going to talk too much more about the history of, from my point of view, but I want to get talking about, I want to get talking with my two friends here, with Jean and with Peter. And uh, we don't really have a who's going to go first, who's going to go second. I think we'll feed off of each other, kind of. And we do have uh, an outline that maybe we'll follow and maybe we won't. But all in all, this is going to be the tale of two dentists. And uh, because uh, Jean was a dentist in Bedford for a long, long time, right. and Peter had his orthodontist practice in Golden Bridge. In Katona. In Katona. With the Katona Medical Group. With the Katona Medical Group. So you're going to get into your history, uh, but I think with that, I'm going to ask how you each came to live in uh, the Three Lakes area, and maybe we'll start with Peter because you've lived here longer. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I came here because my grandparents had a cottage on the south shore of Lake Oscalita. So I came there in July 25th of 1932. My grandparents had that cottage pr 
approximately 15 years before I got there. So uh, it's a, it was a cottage that was purchased from Sears and Roebuck as a pre-cut cottage. And the cottage cost $800. And it was placed on rented land. From Mary Knapp? Mary, Mary Knapp, Knapp owned that land? Okay. Mary Knapp owned the land and we had a 99 year lease. My grandparents had a 99 year lease on the land. So uh, they were able to put a cottage there for $800 and I enjoyed it from day one. Uh, and um, my parents were there and my grandparents were there and all my cousins were there. So we have many fond memories of Lake Oscalita. But just one small clarification, I now live on Lake Ripawan. I oh, started okay. out living That's on right. Lake, I started Across out living street. on Lake Oscalita, but after Betty and I got married, we ended up on Lake Ripawan. And I understand you told Betty she better like living on a lake or the marriage might not happen. Yes, Is that, that true? was that was one of the prerequisites <laughs> of uh, marrying me uh, because I liked the lake and I enjoyed it ultimately just so much that I wanted our children to enjoy it as I did. But before you were married, you your family was summer people, yes, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and Jean, how about you? Well, the way I came up here was the fact that my father was a fisherman and he used to go up and rent a boat at Dickens' boathouse. And while he was out fishing, he saw this piece of property for sale, which was owned by the sheriff of Westchester County. Do you remember so, what sheriff that was? You know, I really don't remember That's his name. That's probably not important. All I know is he used to raise peacocks, and they used to walk around all over the place. But anyway, he bought that piece of property and built the house, what he called his summer house, on the lake. As I remember, because I used to live on Lakeview Road near where that house was, wasn't it kind of on the side of a cliff? That's why it was never sold, because it was so steep. But my father was in the construction business, so he knew all about how to put a house up there, and he was in the heavy construction business. So he had plenty of stone and granite to work with, and that's how we first came up here. Okay, and how old were you? Were a baby or a young child? Or? Oh, I was a young child then, because that was probably in the late 30s. Okay. Yeah. And your father, uh, I understand also being in the, being a stonemason and being in the construction business, had a lot to do with the bridges on some of the parkways and... Uh, Most of the bridges in Long Island were of his... From his company. He built them. Yeah. And also the United... Peter was telling me he thought your dad worked on the United Nations building. He worked in the United Nations and he worked up at West Point. He put up one of the buildings up there. Yeah. So, and he used to run a stone quarry up in Niana, Connecticut, which is now a nuclear plant. Oh, okay. I think I know where that is. Yeah. So that's how we came up here, and it worked out. Okay, and then when you and Anne Marie got married, is that when you came to live across Oscalita Road in the Twin Lakes Peninsula, or or how did how did you get your permanent house that you live in now? Well, I opened up my practice in Bedford after I graduated from Columbia Dental School, and. Uh, Amory and I got talking at one time, and uh, she said, don't open up a practice in New York, because otherwise you're going to be stuck there for the rest of your life. So we started hunting around, and my father said to us one day when we were up there visiting my parents up at Wakabuck, he said, there's a house for sale over in Twin Lakes. Why don't you go take a look at it? That way there you won't have to schlep back and forth from Bedford to New York, to the Bronx. So we went over and there was a house that was for sale for a person named Mr. Ziegler. So like everybody else, we said it was a Sunday. 
we looked at the house and so on and so forth. And we said, we'll let you know. That was Sunday. Okay. Monday morning, I got a telephone call from a lawyer in Tarrytown. He said, I heard you were looking at Mr. Ziegler's house over in Twin Lakes. I said, yeah. He says, I got a good deal for you. I says, what do you mean by a good deal? He said, Mr. Ziegler dropped dead last night. Oh no. He said, and he owes quite a bit of money. So oh. he gave me, he quoted me a price. We said yes. Then that's how we got over there. My father at one time wanted to buy Twin Lakes. It was owned by a woman by the name of Mrs. Holden. She wanted $30,000 for it, for the whole shooting match in there. My father offered her twenty five. dollars Neither one of them budged. That's how Brazelin Porter and Wheelock got that property. And from and from there on, the develop the rest of the peninsula was developed, right? Oh yes. And pretty much now, not summer homes as much as it is year-round homes, right? Oh no, not now everybody is permanent. You know, permanent there now. And uh, because I remember when we first moved into Twin Lakes, I came home one day from the office. My wife was crying. I said, what are you crying about? She says, I can't live here. There's nobody here. <laughs> <laughs> that has changed. I was going to ask, because you, you're each dentist, but different parts, different fields in the dentistry. That's right. And when I was looking at my notes from when we met to set this up, that you each came to it from quite a different way. So Peter will give you a chance to tell how you became, how you uh, went to dental school and how you segued into what you did for your very long career. Well, I actually first got interested in dentistry because as a young boy, I made a lot of trips to the dentist and I liked all of the instruments that the dentist used and he was nice enough to let me squirt the air and the water and things like that. And, I, I got sort of interested in that whole concept and that was when I was approximately in seventh grade. And I said, well, I think, I'll, I think this is something I might be interested in, so I will try to do whatever I have to do to make that happen. And so from then on, I got into sciences and math and, and that kind of thing. And uh, through high school, I was very... Uh, helpful with building things for theater groups and I liked using my hands and and my interest in dentistry was still there so I at the end of high school I decided well I'd better apply to a school well maybe where there's a dental school along with the college and I looked around and I found out that the State University of New York at Buffalo had an undergraduate division as well as a dental school division so I said I'm going to apply there so I applied to one school and got into the University of Buffalo. And then when it came time to go to dental school, I applied there to one dental school and I got accepted into the one dental school that I cared about and graduated in 1958 and uh, then did a residency program at the Buffalo State Hospital. And then after the residency was completed, I was, of course, looking for a job. My wife and I got married in 1954, and by the time dental school was over, we had three children, and, <laughs> and we were looking to have a few more. And um, I decided, well, I have to really get a job. I can't start a practice. So I applied for a job at the Connecticut uh, State Hospital in Newtown, Connecticut. So I went from Buffalo State Hospital to Newtown, <laughs> Connecticut. And that's where I then found out about the Twin Lakes opportunity and then we moved to Twin Lakes. Oh, good. Now, I think that was also the time of the Korean War. So 
you could have a was there a draft deferment kind of well, situation? Well, the, the Korean War was actually in 49 and 50 52. when I was getting out of high school. Okay. And in order to go to undergrad school in those days without getting drafted, you had to go and get take a test. It was known as a deferment test to be deferred from the Army. And so I went to the 96th Street Armory in Manhattan, in New York, and passed the deferment test and that allowed me not to get drafted and to go to dental to go to undergrad school mm -hmm. and that was the end of my military career <laughs> oh dear well gene you have a different story as i remember from our pre our pre talk well when uh, i was in the navy on a light cruiser we had a dentist on board and i used to watch him work and I was pretty handy with my hands. And I thought to myself, this would be a good way to earn a living. And that's how I got into dentistry and uh, I've so, enjoyed it ever since. So after the Navy, that's when you went to Colum started at Columbia? That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah that was uh, 1946. I remember at our pre-meeting that uh, you got talking about making gold crowns. Yeah. And I think we'll kind of end the dentistry talk if you would just give us a little synopsis of what it takes or what that process is. And I understand both of you made your wedding rings from the gold in the dentist that you had available to you as dentists. So, Gene, I'll put, put well, the camera back on you. I had a casting machine in my office with an oven where we used to melt the gold. And uh, I just loved making things. So all the gold inlays and the gold crowns that I used in my office, I made with blowtorch and casting machine and so on and so forth. And uh, that was the best part of dentistry. I, uh, I mean, I liked the rest of it, but this was really right up my alley. Yeah. So all, all your patients had personally made gold crowns or gold uh, whatever was needed instead of it going now as it goes today to the computer to be made in some, some uh, dental laboratory. Laboratory. Uh, laboratory. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Oh yeah. And uh, as far as I was concerned, Gold was the best filling material going, bar none. And the reason for it was that gold wore, if the bite wasn't exactly right when you made the filling or the crown, the gold wore just wore right into the bite and it worked out fine. Well, we thank you for that. Now, let's segue to uh, the Three Lakes. We'll get into the Three Lakes and uh, uh, I think maybe uh, talk about how, uh, how they've come to where they are now, doing a little bit of, of how it, they've segued from summer to full time to how they're taken care of by, uh, I think first there was a water system and then there uh, became the three, well, 50 years ago, the Three Lakes Council was formed to kind of keep an eye on how the lakes would not be ruined over time. So, yeah. Peter, I, think, I think I can speak to that um, because I was one of the original members that started the Three Lakes Council. And the way it started was a gentleman bought a house on Twin Lakes Road who worked at Union Carbide. And because of his position at Union Carbide, apparently he could get a lot of the herbicide called 2,4-D. And he had a garage full of it. And he offered it to the Three Lakes, to the Two Lake community. Anybody who would like to come down to my garage and get some 2,4-D, you can get rid of all the weeds in the lake, which many of the people who came up from New York City didn't understand were an integral part of the environment and the ecology of the lake. You don't want to get rid of the weeds. So I got a little concerned about that and I had a friend on Lake 
I was living on Lake Ripawam at the time. I had a friend on Lake Ascalita who was a lawyer. His name was Andrew Wilson. And he and I got to talking about this person who wanted to give away the 24D. And we said, oh, that, that can't happen. And Andrew said, well, why don't we get someone from Lake Wakabuck and we'll have a representative from each of the three lakes and we'll stop this 24D thing before it gets started. So we got a hold of a person by the name of Wayne Van Tassel on Wakabuck and we got together. And because of Andrew's legal background, he was able to stop this person on Twin Lakes from giving away 24D for free. And that was the actual beginning of the Three Lakes Council. The three of us started it and uh, it just grew from there. And now I believe, according to information I've received, because of one particular person, I would say, and her, her name is Tara Owen. She is the one that took our newsletter and formatted it the way the newsletter is still being formatted over the 50 years. And it is now supposedly the best newsletter in New York State of any, any lake area. So I want to make sure that Tara gets the credit for doing mm -hmm. the newsletter. And the newsletter keeps the community up to snuff on, on how the lake should be appreciated and how it should be uh, treated, not treated chemically, but how it should be treated by the people who live around it to preserve as best they can the, the pristineness of, of the lakes. Now Union Carbide comes into play again uh, I think it was 1973 with the aerators the that aerators. were put in the lake. So I don't know if you or Gene or whoever's into aerators wants to talk about them. Do you want to talk about the aerators, Gene, or do you want me to talk about them? Yeah, you talk about them and you can tell them about the, how they drop them down with the helicopters. Okay. Yeah. Well, Union Carbide was trying to make a business out of regenerating lakes that were dying. There's a, a term called eutrophia. You, youth, it, it, it's an aging of lakes. And they made an aerator that you would put into the water in a lake and pump oxygen or air down at the lower depths and the dissolved oxygen would get into the water and make a greater depth of area where fish could live by increasing the oxygen content of the lake. And so in 1973, we found out, or we were actually uh, called on by Union Carbide if we would like to experiment and put two aerators in Lake Wakabuck. And the council, the Three Lakes Council said, sure, that sounds like a great idea and we'll do it. So in 1973, a couple of helicopters came over Lake Wakabuck and drop these enormous machines down into the lake, sort of northwest of where the Wakaba Country Club Beach is. And we had them in there functioning, I want to say for about nine or 10 years, but we found out that it cost us about $9,000 in those days just to, electro, just to use electric, electricity to keep the aerators going. And we were not a, a highly, uh, I would say, uh, financially organized group of people in the Three Lakes Council. And so I believe that we made the wrong decision to stop aerating, but we did. And the aerators today are still in the lake, but they're not functioning anymore. Three Lakes Council has really done a wonderful job. And a couple of years ago, they wrote a, a history book. Uh, celebrating their 50 years, which I do have, and I think I'd like to share some of the pictures in it with Henry so that maybe some of the things you've been talking about, like the aerators going into the lake, there is a picture of that in the book. I would say that the, the Three Lakes Council has come a long way, quantum leaps from its beginning, and it is a very highly informative paper that we put out, the, the Three Lakes Council newsletter every year, and the current president, who is Janet Anderson from Twin Lakes, has done a magnificent job with the whole thing, and the 
all of the help she gets from the contributors to the three to the three late newsletter are very informed scientifically oriented people and that's why i guess it has become one of the best if not the best newsletter in the state of new york good to hear that mm -hmm. now we've talked about dentistry we've talked about stewardship of the three lakes area uh, let's get personal and talk a little bit about what it was like growing up as uh, teenagers or whatever time frame you might want to talk about and then uh, some good memories of, of the lake because of the lakes all of the lakes have uh, their individual uh, outstanding uh, things about them so uh, we get back to, uh, to to Dr. Jean over there and uh, uh, I know he's told me a few stories of uh, well, when the iconic part of Lake Wakabuck, of course, is Castle Rock. So, do you have any experiences with Castle Rock? I only, <laughs> I only dove, well, I didn't dive, I jumped <laughs> off the top of Castle Rock. And uh, that was the only time I ever did that. But uh, it was a very, very busy place during the summer because people used to come from all over, especially in Richfield. They had a mob of kids used to come. Then they closed the road off up on top of it. Well, the Castle Rock. Rock was about, it's about 60 feet tall. Yeah. And above a deep part of Lake Wakabuck. And it was a go-to it was a destination for the teenagers and some not so teenagers. Well, there was a group of guys that used to come and they used to go to Carry a Bit Road and then swim across to the rock. And they used to camp there and it was a great place, but you could get in a lot of trouble if you didn't know what you were doing there because the rocks were there. Below, below the cliff. Below. Right. Oh yeah, and there were only certain spots there where you could jump off and be safe. Otherwise, you'll have end up hitting one of those rocks and you'd really be in trouble. But, but it was a very said, popular place. I guess so. And also the Indian ovens. Do you have any, did you ever explore the Indian ovens? The only thing I know about the Indian ovens is I'm trying to figure out whoever owned them. I know at one time, I think Mrs. Height, I think she said she owned them. Now, well, whether she, she was right on the point. She owned on the point. Yeah. Now, whether she owned that island or not, I don't know. But uh, I always thought the town owned it. I, I think it's a mystery. Then there's another mystery of Ed Cantine's canoe. Oh. <laughs> you want to tell us about that and then we'll go hear what Peter can Well. Explain. Mr. Cantine, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was clearing out the front of his property on Wakabuck, and he was picking up all the stones, putting them in the canoe, going out into the cove, flipping the canoe over, and all the rocks would drop down. Well, he did that for quite a while, but on the last trip, <laughs> the rocks shifted in the canoe, and the canoe went straight down. Nobody ever found it. And this was decades ago. That was decades ago, and it's still there. With the elephants. With the elephants' bones. <laughs> <laughs> and another story for another time. Peter, how about uh, your well, end of, of course, Castle Rock? About, did you ever jump off of Castle Rock? Of course, Castle Rock was a big attraction. Uh, I, I hesitate to say it, but I think I was smarter than most because I did not jump off of Castle Rock. Uh, I, I'm basically afraid of heights. I don't like to go up on ladders more than two or three feet. So um, I was never into jumping off. But most of my friends did. And they all lived through it. And um, yeah, I, I've never heard of anybody dying from jumping off. No, there. no. Maybe the no. ambulances have come. I don't know. There's a lot of a lot of watches and a lot of gold and stuff have been falling off people when they hit the water, okay. 
and a couple of people I have heard have broken their wrists because they put their hands out and when they hit the water from 60 feet above they get bilateral broken wrists so I mean but I've never heard of anybody being hospitalized right. really so right. but you you're afraid of heights yet you have you're going to tell us about the swinging bridge okay. <laughs> well at the you might explain what it is okay. and where it is at the east end of Lake Ripawam, there is a, a boathouse. And from that boathouse, you can walk up a road. And I'm talking now in, a, in 1953, 54. Uh, and you get up to the top of that road, and there is a bridge that goes from the land, or was a bridge, that goes from the land out to a big hemlock tree. And the people who owned the property then... Now that property is in Ridgefield, that, actually. That property is actually in Ridgefield, right. And the bridge went from land out to the tree, and from the tree they hung a bridge that went in the circumference around the whole tree. And then you could go out there, and it wasn't really attached to the tree except by the chains. So when you got out there, the, the bridge would swing about a foot in every direction around the circumference of the tree. So it was, a, it was definitely a place where kids liked to go and, and ultimately it got into a state of disrepair and the people who owned it took it down. But for probably 20 or 25 years, it was one of the attractions on, on Lake Ripawam for sure. I would think so, yeah. yes. Wish it were still there when I moved to town in the 60s, but I guess it had gone by that Yes, time. I think it had. Um, I want to get a couple of mentions. Um, you both have fairly large families, and uh, I think 11 children between you, I'm not sure. You have seven, seven and you have four. four. That adds up to 11. This adds up to 11. You, the Trez family, made their way into the newspaper. Was it the New York Times or and the, the Westchester paper? No, the New York, well, it started out with a local paper. Okay. Got picked up by the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune. Because of your because strange Because we had a very habit. strange eating habit, which was <laughs> eating dinner in the morning. And the way that all came about was having seven children and having them all in school at the same time. Somebody would be in ballet, somebody would be in some sport, somebody, everybody had after school evening activities. And Betty just got tired of cooking a nice dinner and nobody was there to eat. So I suggested one time, well, the only time we're really together is when we're getting ready to leave here in the morning. And so let's have dinner in the morning. And so we started having dinner in the morning and Betty and I would put something in the oven and set the timer and the timer would go off at 3 a.m. And by seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, Whatever we put in there would be ready to eat, and the kids would come down, and we'd have dinner. And we did that for a number of years, probably, I want to say, at least 10 years. Wow. Um, and it, because of the rareness of the whole thing, we had teachers who wanted to come to our house in the morning for, break, for dinner. And uh, it, it was a very interesting time. And uh, some of our children, when they were applying to college, said, oh yeah, we, we did this, and the college people thought that was really weird. And, but it, it got a lot of attention. But I must say that the very fact of eating something highly nutritious in the morning, before you go off for your day's activities, improved, it seemed to improve, their performance in school, their performance in everything. I lost 12 pounds by not even being on a diet, but just by eating once one big meal in the morning and nothing else. And then in the evening, Betty would just prepare a salad or something like that. And uh, it, it sufficed. But the International Herald Tribune picked it up and we got calls from people in Europe, particularly <laughs> ex-patients of mine saying, oh, Dr. Trey's, I, I saw your name in the Herald Tribune in England, and what are you doing? You know, it was like I was, we were doing something really weird. But anyway, uh, it worked out very well. 
I wish we were still doing it, but we don't do it for the two of us. Right. Okay. <laughs> and Jean, uh, I don't know as much about your background, but we do know that the, your wife, Anne Marie, maybe you could tell us a little bit of her involvement in, in the town uh, activities, especially the, se the seniors. Well, she became director of the senior citizens uh, after we had moved into Twin Lakes. And uh, I really was wound up in my own practice, so I never knew what was going on. <laughs> but uh, she loved it, and the people loved her. And uh, she was a very uh, outgoing, outgoing person. person. And she I was. Think could get lots of people involved in what she was doing. That's exactly right. Yeah. I remember from our time living over in the Three Lakes area when we first came to town that you had a great Pyrenees, which is a beautiful white dog. And I think you had a little story on how the dog came to live with you. I was in the office one day and a woman came in to the office and she said to me, Dr. Tadaldi, I need a bridge, but I haven't got the money to pay for it. So I looked at her. And I said, well, what do you have? <laughs> she says, I have a female Great Pyrenees. It's going to have puppies. I'll give you the pick of the litter. So I thought for a while, okay, I'll trade you a bridge for the Pyrenees. So anyway, on Christmas, Christmas Eve, I even forget what year it was, she called me up. She says, the puppies are ready to go. Come on over to the house and pick the one you want. So I went over to her house and she said, they're down in the basement. Just go down the stairs, pick the one. There were six of them. Pick the one you want and that's it. I walked down the stairs, I sat down and this puppy came running over to me, jumped in my lap. I didn't even look at the rest of them. I just picked the dog up and off we went. Then when I got home with the puppy, then it was another battle. The kids, he's going to sleep with me. No, he's going to sleep with me. <laughs> so we put him in a child's playpen and that's where he stayed. And we had him for 14 years. That's a good age for a big dog. Which is great for a big dog. And the uh, funny part about it is we were going to show him the first show we went to with him was a puppy's show. The judge was checking the dogs and he walks over to my Pyrenees and he wanted to look at his teeth so he grabs him by the muzzle and the puppy <laughs> grabs him by the wrist. That was the end of that. No more shows. No more shows. <laughs> uh, he was a great dog. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you two, and I don't know if there's something perhaps that we didn't go over that you really would like to share with the world of LCTV. Uh, G? You know what I notice now in the Three Lakes? It used to be when Peter and I were growing up as kids, there were more children around and things were very active on the lakes. I mean, I go out on my lake, I never see a boat. Yesterday, I took a tour around Wakaba uh, with Barbara Capo and her boat. There wasn't a soul out there. There wasn't even a guy fishing, which is very unusual. What has happened is all the young people that used to live or were there have all grown up and moved. The only ones that are left are us old buggers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, keeping, you're keeping the lake sane for the next generation. Hopefully, in another few years, younger people will move in and I'm sure maybe they will come back. Peter, any final yeah, comments? Yeah, I, I, I think I, we're, we've overlooked one of the big issues on Lake Wakabuck and that was the presence of Dickens' Boathouse. Oh, how oh. could I forget? Well, it's easy to forget. You well, know, Gene even mentioned that was how his dad found it. Yeah. Yes, and originally, Dickens' Boathouse, 
for people who are familiar with Oscalita Road, uh, was on the northwest corner going north on Oscalita Road toward Twin Lakes. It was right at the corner of the channel and it was called Between the Lakes. Mr. Dickens, Merwin Dickens' father had made that, that little boathouse there and he called it Between the Lakes. And as a child growing up, I always heard my parents and my grandparents saying, well, let's go up between the lakes. And they had fishing gear there and candy and that kind of thing. And I never knew what they were talking about between the lakes until one day I actually saw a picture of that area of the lakes and I saw the sign between the lakes. So I knew what that meant. But when I was a junior and a senior in high school, I worked for Merwin Dickens at his boathouse which is now the first house on the right when you come into Wakabuck. On, on, uh... Through the channel. Right. Through the channel. If right. you go through the channel, which are not natural channels. They were man-made by the Army Corps of Engineer, uh, I want to say sometime in the early... It was early, early 1900s early, or late 1800s. Yes, exactly, Maureen. And um, they connected those three lakes because New York City wanted to make sure that those three lakes would go into Cross River Reservoir and supply enough water to Cross River Reservoir along with all the other reservoirs in New York State to go into Manhattan. But anyway, I worked there um, as a junior and senior in high school until finally, sadly, it got pretty well known and the whole Dickens Boathouse was a great place for teenagers. They had a jukebox there. They had a, they had uh, hot dogs and hamburgers goodbye there. We could dance. They would allow us to dance in the in the this restaurant. This was area. also approachable from Cove Road. Yes, either by boat or you could turn into Cove Road, which is one of the roads into Lake. Wakabuck. That's that's still there now, yeah. right? And um, anyway, what happened was it, it got to be fairly well known and people came in from out of the area and rented one of the 30 rowboats or 30 canoes that were there. And there was no place, they'd come up on weekends and there was no place that they could go except be on the lakes because all the property was private. And so they would picnic on the lake and throw cans and dirt, I mean paper and their rubbish into the lakes. And on Monday mornings, the people who lived on the lake, Lake Wakabuck in particular, were pretty upset with the condition of the lake. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the exact date when the people went to Merwin Dickens and said, we'd like to buy your business and close it. And so that happened. It may be in the Lewisboro uh, history book. I'm not I sure. I don't think so. But I didn't see it. I have pictures from the firehouse, the firemen would go there, I think, as well. And I have pictures of, of the stools at the counter and, and what you're taught, you know, how you explained before how people could dance there, the inside of, of the, the, the boathouse, right. where you would work, I guess, as a soda jerk or whatever. Yeah, and I, t I mainly took care of the boats yeah. and, the, oh, okay. and the, the rowboats and the canoes. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that when it rained, they were all emptied out and so it ready to go. it been the late 50s or the... Or Probably, the yeah, in the late 50s I was in college right. and dental school. So I'm not exactly sure when, when the actual purchase of the business mm -hmm. happened and then it went up for sale and a private people private people own it. Well, now. Merwin Dickens still lived there in 66 when we moved right. to Lakeshore Drive. So, I mean to, uh, yeah, Lakeview Drive, Lakeview Road. <laughs> but so, so. but the, Dickens, the Dickens family was there for a long time. Oh, they go back to the 1800s. Right, right. We're talking today with Dr. Eugene Tadaldi, who was a dentist in Bedford, New York for many, many years, and also with Dr. Peter Trace, who was an orthodontist who had his office in Katona, New York. I want to thank everybody for joining us on this visit with Dr. Eugene Tadaldi and Dr. Peter Trace, both 
longtime residents of the Three Lakes area of Lewisboro. You're watching Lewisboro Community Television, Channel 20.